the two kingdoms of love and the differences between the two kingdoms based on love. Before, as we start, I want to ask you this simple question. What, and when you hear the word a kingdom, what is a kingdom? What do you think? All right, can we just define that together, define that in community here? Okay, a land under a sovereignty of a king. Land and people. Land and people, too, okay? Any other descriptions or additions to that? That's fair, yeah. A place where we belong. Yeah, a place where citizens belong, in, in that, under that reign, right? Very good, too. Mm-hmm. Kingdom. Some cases where we don't belong. <laughs> Right. I was touring um, the Tower of London and uh, also uh, some of the museums and stuff there in, in England. And halfway through the tour, I just kept realizing this is a kingdom of which there are many layers of which I can never belong. <laughs> There's not a chance for me ever. <laughs> Interesting. John, sorry about that. You can, right? Yeah, I can. Yeah, you can. I, I can. I belong. You belong. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> in that one. Anything else? In all the descriptions that we can think of, a kingdom obviously has the word king in it. It relies, if you will, on a person. As the person of the kingdom goes, so goes the, the people. Or so, so go the people, so goes the kingdom itself. So when you think of the word reign in a kingdom then you have the good and gracious reign of God, if we're thinking of the kingdom of God. You have a good and gracious reign of God, and what does that do? Well, that channels his love from heaven, his reign from heaven onto earth. That's why we pray, may your kingdom come on earth and your will be done right here and right now, as it is being done where? From your throne room, from heaven. Combine the two. All right. But if you have a dictator at the top, who will suffocate you, you will have in a, a sad people, an oppressed people, a highly taxed people. I'll tell you that, right? You will have a, a, a struggle among the people. Why? Because the one leader is consuming, if you will, all of the resources and all of the attention and all of the authority and using it often more for himself than, and for love of himself than actually for the people, and so we're going to see that in Saul today. Today, you're going to see a difference between Saul and his son. Two weeks ago, we talked about covenant friendship. Please go back and hear that one. It was kind of a foundational message about friendship in the church. Jonathan and David had just made a pact, a covenant together. Jonathan, instead of killing his arch rival, which would have been David, he loves him as a dear and closest friend, as his very own heart. But his father is the opposite. His father, you will see... Jonathan makes a pact and serves David with loyalty. The rest of the verses in this chapter, you're going to see three things about Saul, and actually many things about Saul, and how he starts to spiral downward, inward, and negative against David. He is, he is the opposite of his son, Jonathan. The two kingdoms that we're going to see of love today are this. Number one, you will see the gracious love of God. In one, and number two, you will see the kingdom of the disordered love of self. Both are based on love. Both have two different consequences when they are served. David is the champion in our story of number one. Saul is the criminal, if you will, or the culprit of kingdom number two in this episode in 1 Samuel 18. Here is the point if you happen to be taking notes, which I highly encourage. Number one is this. You will always be serving one of these two kingdoms. There is no Switzerland of neutrality between these two kingdoms. And a little secret for you, Switzerland's really never always that neutral. <laughs> but there is no kind of neutrality like I'm just going to be indifferent and live my life where I am. That's, that's kingdom two. You see, we were wired, we were created to love because we were created by a loving God. We all desire love, and in fact, we all desire to follow and give love. It's part of our, it's part of our humanity. 
It's part of our designer who gave it to us. The question is, is it Christ or Christocentric, as we say, centered love, ordered, or is it trying to find and seek love everywhere else and disordered love? What do I mean by disordered love? I'll just give you a definition. It means to live under the reign of disordered love that you will consistently or constantly look for love in all of the wrong places. An old song, you're addicted to love, right? But love that takes you in all of the wrong places. What, what do I mean by wrong places? Now this, friends, as I go through the message, this is where we have to, we have to identify the things in our hearts because the, the, the sermon today, the, the passage is written from the viewpoint of Saul. David's out there as a character, but now the writer wants us to go in and analyze and look at Saul's evil heart in his disordered love of selfishness and self-centeredness and his ego and pride. So when we start hearing about these things, we need to start using that as our, as our light of analysis, our reflection. When you start seeing things, you have to understand that disordered loves start very small and they start in the heart for us. They're very hidden and they start to produce similar results that we'll look at. Here are some of them. You might look in the wrong places for love, thinking I will be satisfied and very happy and loved. I will feel love through physical relationship. If I can have another person's flesh, body, something touching, something fulfilling the cravings and appetites of my own body. And everywhere you go, every supermarket, every cafe, bar, even here in Italy, they play I would say English, love songs talking about that. Like the sexual relationship is the highest form of love that you can have. And yet you will break every rule and fence of God to try to obtain that. That's love in all the wrong places. Looking for love. It might be for some of you that you have, we say, a huge emotional need. There's a vacuum deep down inside. Maybe that you don't want others to know about. And your, emo your emotions, you want affirmation or you want to have romance. And that feeling of romance fills you up. It's that search for the soulmate, you know. And so it makes you discontent with people that are around you and with the world that's around you. Why? Because there's this idealized romance that will fill up my emotions. Looking for love in all the wrong places. You need emotional love. It might be that you want adoration and adulation. So you put things out that people will praise. Look at my achievements. Look at my career path. Look at my education. Look at my abilities. Look at the craft that I do. Adoration, adulation. We're going to see that in Saul. It might be that you really long for and strive in quiet ways. And this is so hard to discern. But we have to allow the Holy Spirit to do that today, okay? And that is affirmation and approval from others. You fear others so much that you seek their affirmation and approval so you don't have to fear them. You see? Adoration and affirmation. And so you will make your decisions and you will present. With, some people have coined this image management. You put a lot of work into image management so that they will affirm you. So that you will feel like I'm somebody. It's looking for love in all the wrong places. Others might be through physical appearance. How you dress. How you work out. How you look. What you eat. Your haircuts. Your, your watches. Your cars. Your, um, what you invest in. Your toys. Your gear. Gear as in like equipment, not drugs. Okay, guys? Let's just be... Uh, <laughs> It, it might be personal appearance, like what is the image that I'm presenting to others? It might be personal achievement. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting these different things and I'm showing them. I really want to put them on display. I've achieved well, and so I'm somebody. So then there's the aspect of feel, feeling loved and fulfilled because everybody's recognizing my achievements. It might be, even through the subtle Simple things of more likes and, and little hearts and little cats emoji 
of joy on your, on your walls and on your Instagrams. It might be an online social approval. We do know that that is an addiction. The social approval, it's constant selfies every day, all the time, looking, look at my appearance, look at in the mirror, look at how I'm dressed, look at what I'm wearing, look at how I look, look how my hair is today. These are things I'm never attempted by, <laughs> personally. But for some of you, this might be a real area where you're looking to get more followers, more likes, more hearts, more cats. For, for your feeds. No, seriously. It's a sense of online approval that says, I, it, as I get that, I feel approved and loved. And it might just be the cultural approval of others around you. What people from the base would say. What people from the culture around me would say. People in my county, people in my city, people in my, work, in my workplace and workshop. What will they say? What's the culture? I'm going to literally... I'm going to discard, if you will, obeying the word of God so that they won't criticize me because I, want to, I don't want to feel criticism. I don't have the courage to love God. I have, I don't, I have the, if you will, I don't want to feel the criticism of others not loving me. Do you see that? In other words, everywhere we go, there is a kingdom of self-serving love, isn't there? You can participate in it. A kingdom walks and rules with its citizens under a king, a king of disordered love. And there are two kings on the shelf, serving God or serving self. I heard that when I was in high school. It always stuck with me. <laughs> you have two choices on the shelf, serving God or serving self. He is going to be your king. And when you declare, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower, he has to be the king. And what do we do every day? We're really saying, no, we want the Lord Jesus Christ to reign in our hearts. So I've got to step down from that throne which means I can't be constantly thinking about and serving myself. I must look for his love in my life to be channeled through toward others. You see, one is selfish, or if you will, propping me up to be worshipped in many subtle and overt ways. And the other is self-giving and looks like the cross standing behind me of God giving life away. Yes, when Christ comes in your heart, he will propel you to risk and to give your life away in love. And that's the joyous mission that he has you on. Serving yourself will never result in joy. It will always, always result in fear and then death. I promise you, we'll see that here in our passage today. In our passage, it's fascinating that love is mentioned six times in our passage. Uh, whenever we're interpreting scripture or trying to prepare messages, we're always looking for these repetitive things and key words six times. There are other mentions of other words. The, the word fear is mentioned three times, double that of love, which is exciting because that means God's kingdom of love is ever, if you will, even double or multiplied more than the kingdom of fear. It's more powerful than the kingdom of fear, more abundant. And it is always applied in this passage to Saul. Verse 12, verse 15, verse 29. You can find it applied to Saul in increasing increments. And then the word success is mentioned seven times. God with David or David's success because God had fought for him. So everybody loves David <laughs> because they're starting to see God's love in David. It's like Jonathan loves David at the beginning the people of Israel love David, right? As they're singing. The women are loving David as they're coming back. You'll see that in the passage. Saul's daughter loves David in this passage too. And everybody, wherever he goes, loves David except for one person in the kingdom, and that's King Saul. And so that is the foil. Saul alone is the foil of all the of, of this aspect of the two kingdoms in conflict. It is a cosmological battle. What are we saying? When you see David's exploits and his successes in this passage, you cannot help but be reminded or think of Jesus's ministry. Because what has David just finished? He just killed Goliath, didn't he? Well, if you think about it, when Jesus was tempted in the desert, he was confronted by the great snake, just like Goliath was the great snake. We talked all about in our, la our last messages, so go there. So what did he do? He killed Goliath, and now he, what did Jesus do? When he won and conquered in the temptation in the desert, 
He returned back to Galilee and he started his ministry. And everywhere he went, people started to talk about him. They loved him. And they were bringing people. And everywhere he went, he was surrounded by crowds, wasn't he? And he had success. And he was conquering, if you will, the enemy over and over. The works of the devil. He was just destroying them. So what's going on? David's early emergence as a king is prefiguring what Christ would be like. Can you imagine the people of Galilee in the day of Jesus? When they saw all of his exploits and his work and the fame of his name going everywhere, what they would have thought about. What would they have thought about? Well, this reminds us of early David. This reminds us of David. David did this. and So it would be easy to call him later in his ministry, son of David, over and over. As they, because he looked like him. And because David is prefiguring Christ. Okay? Make sense so far? So I want you to think of him as a greater David. All right, so as we go through this, again, I'm going to repeat, we're, we're taking this, the writer takes it from the perspective of Saul. So we need to look at the kingdom of disordered love and fear to be able to understand our kingdom that we want to live for, which is the kingdom of love and what we, if you will, are fueled by in our life. The first episode that we're going to see are the two different ways that David and Saul understand if you will, attention and affirmation and celebrity. So I entitled this section, The Songs of Celebrity. You'll see this in verses 6 to 9. What, what's going on? It is Saul's desire to drain the love from the affirmation and adulation of others. And this is a temptation that we will have. We want to have the affirmation, attention, and, affirma- and adulation of others. Okay? Songs of Celebrity. Let's look at our passage now. As they were coming home... When David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. So they had planned a parade and a choir. And what did they sing? And the women sang to one another as they celebrated. And here's the song. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. It probably had more rhyme and a little more catchy in in Hebrew uh, than it is in English. It's probably one of those songs that when you hear it, it's stuck with you for two or three days, which is one reason why it will drive Saul crazy. And Saul was crazy angry, really angry, ferocious, if you will, in his anger, because the saying displeased him. He didn't get the retweets. He's upset, and he said, They have ascribed to David tens of thousands, and to me only a thousand. In other words, what more can the guy have but the whole kingdom itself? He's upset at an underling receiving credit. But he, and so what happened was Saul eyed David. Here's suspicion. Here's evil intent. He eyed David. From that day on. In Hebrew, there's a word for two eyes, double eyes, and, and, and it's a word called uh, ayan hara. There's other words. Ayan is the idea for eye, but hara is this word for evil. And it's evil eye. It's, it's like looking at people on the surface with one eye and seeing the surface, but then thinking of other motives, like trying to judge their motives and seeing their hypocrisy and seeing other things behind them and being suspect of them or thinking evil of them. That's why Jesus says that you should be careful about the beam that's in your eye. It might be ayan hara. You might actually have wood in your own eye rather than trying to pick out the speck in the other. Or he says that a man has a good eye. What does that mean? He's saying the eye is the opening to the soul. And having a good eye means that you don't have evil eye. Like Korah, who fought against Moses, he started with ayan hara. He had evil eye. So he, evil eye always divides kingdoms. But it starts with how you look at others and how you perceive them. Saul starts with being suspicious. How do, what do you think Saul's acting like here? Any comments? First reactions? What's he, what's he acting like? Jealous. He's jealous, yeah. It's starting, to, it's starting to grow. Okay, anything else? He's kind of not in reality, is he? Because in a sense, it, but you have to understand, here's, here's how his anger got going. 
you, gotta, you have to put yourself in the place of Saul. Go through these towns. Okay, so you've been out in that battlefield for probably around 40, 50 days. Goliath, the biggest enemy, has just been defeated. And you're the king leading your troops you know, through, through the cities, which is normal to be able to have parades of celebration because you know, the enemy was defeated. And you've just led this campaign, right? But the question is, did Saul actually deserve the adulation and the credit? Why not? He didn't kill Goliath. You're exactly right. He didn't deserve it, but boy, he sure wanted it, didn't he? He wanted to take it. It was my administration that did this. <laughs> no, it was, David. it was God's administration through David that did this. So he went after it, right? He wanted the credit. But he, what did he do? He was the representative who was supposed to go out and do this and fight, but he wouldn't. He had the cowardice. Why? The Spirit of God wasn't on him. He was living in his own kingdom, his own kingdom of disordered love. So he, he hid in his tent every day. And then he wants to come out and receive the credit and the adulation. That's, that's problematic, isn't it? <laughs> but the adulation, here's how it stung him so bad. It's stung him because the women, when they got together, they put this song together, and it, was, it would have started out, and it would have pleased him originally. He would be walking through the streets, and on one side, they did it in antiphony. And on one side, the women called out that first phrase, Saul has killed his thousands, but then they added this little extra political uh, tweet, okay? And they sang it from the other side, hashtag 10,000, David 10,000. And so basically they sang it in antiphony back over the top of Saul coming through and David's killed his 10,000s as Saul is coming under, if you will, the parade. So he's hearing when the women called over here with tambourine and music instruments, then he's hearing the call of this other guy who's following him. But we don't see David mentioned. Why? Because he's humble about it. He's not standing up next to Saul saying, well, yeah, hey, look, they're singing about me. I, I, hey, Saul, nudge, nudge. I kind of did kill Goliath just a little bit ago. Remember the head in my hand and all that? Okay. He's not doing that. And instead, he, he's not even mentioned. Why? Because he goes out in service. He continues to play the harp for Saul. So he goes out, kills Goliath, and then he continues to serve. Why? What are we seeing here? The emergence of a humble leader. What are the women saying? There's two things. They're praising David basically by saying, this is the Saul we always wanted. <laughs> so Saul, you did your thing, but man, there's another one who's really, really producing the results that you have never done. This is what we wanted when you first showed up on the scene. But the other thing that they were doing was they were digging at Saul with this. It was a political issue because they knew that the kingdom had been in decline and had made mistakes and that the leader and that Saul had probably uh, been showing issues of rage and anger and all these other things. He was going mad and they had probably heard about this. And so what did they do? They released, if you will, this partisan, this... This political fire, these uncontrolled words, and they put it out there. And as they did, it fueled and fired up the rage that was already resident in Saul's heart and started to snowball, started to make an avalanche. And we're going to see that coming through the, through the passage in this way. You see, Saul wanted a king, God's kingdom to go according to his own opinions of himself. That's disordered love. But... The question then is, with what the women did, was that productive? But probably not. They celebrated and it, it made a division in the, in the kingdom. In other words, you can have served two kingdoms in the same place. Can I say it this way? You can frequent the same church and still be part of two different kingdoms. The kingdom of self and the kingdom of disordered love or the kingdom really of God and his ordered love and still be in the same uh, room together. Um, in this way. But you might ask me, well, you know, Rob, all this different stuff going on in the news and all the different things that are, for instance, the country has gone through recently and all the divisions and the politics and all this, all these different things, changing over of a leader, etc. Is political dissent okay? And I'd say, well, yes, to a degree, because we live in a corrupt age, you know, I was, I was thinking of Richard Nixon's famous interview. Some of you don't even remember who Richard Nixon was, but it's my birthday tomorrow, so um, <laughs> I'm kind of going back. And Richard Nixon had a famous interview. It's almost incriminating, self-incriminating. And he said this famous phrase, um, it's not wrong or it's not illegal if the president does it. 
Well, that would be something Saul would say. Yes, it is illegal. It's illegal if, 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 no matter who does it, if humans do it. Why? Because we live in a corrupt thing. It's not that all of a sudden you take on this role and then you are immune to that which is wrong. And so, yeah, I have a, I have a quote here. Let me, let me read to you uh, one, a, a commenter on this. He said, well, look what happened in, in, in the idea of this king who is trying to run things politically for his own advantage. It went like this. Murderous jealousy then snowballed not only into Saul's total war, on David, but it snowballed throughout all of society. And we will see that coming up passage after passage. All from a political tweet that took place. David killed his ten thousands. That's all it was. <laughs> it was smaller than, than the limit of a tweet, right? And uh, the point here is that political dissent is necessary in a corrupt society. But for believers, it must be done in accordance with God's word. Un because you're saying something, it needs to be said under the law and the word of God. You're Christians representing what you say under God's word. It also must be done with the progress of God's kingdom as its goal. In other words, the kingdom of love needs to be its scope and care for others. If not, here's what will take place. It will not only agitate the fallen human nature towards fallen humanistic agendas, it will also fan the flames of party jealousy and it will set your entire nation ablaze. Political dissent alone is never enough. It may, in fact, be detrimental in that it only breeds animosity, jealousy, and hatred. And that goes for all parties and all platforms speaking and acting outside the law of God. Un, and here, here's the here's key that I really highlighted. Unredeemed political rhetoric is all ultimately hate speech because it all seeks to impose upon other people an idea. By coercive force, a law other than God's revealed will. This is to despise and cajole or cajole men or manipulate men instead of actually loving them. End quote. Dr. McDermott. And uh, uh, he wrote this something like 15 years ago. <laughs> this was not from last week. All right? So it's true. Unredeemed rhetoric shows that I serve the kingdom of, I'm right fighting. Opinion where you're going to bow to my opinion, even if it's political or whatever. Guys, the church is promoting the love of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus Christ. We preach that Christ alone saves nations. Punto basta, as we say in Italian. Learn that. That means period, end, done. Or in English, we say mic drop. <laughs> Punto basta. It's done. It's Christ alone. The amount of articles that I see coming up and the things that I'm seeing, even former Serenissima members responding to others and talking like there is some man who is our savior through politics. That is paganism. That's idolatry. I'm sorry. That's probably the most unpopular thing <laughs> to say. Might even get me kicked off YouTube. I don't care. It's suspect. It's self-serving. We look to Christ alone for Messiah has come. And that uh, comes from Songs of Celebrity. David didn't uh, take that in and pu get puffed up. Saul did and got angry. And that led to spears of jealousy. Take a look with me in verses 10 to 16. It's the love from the elimination of others. If I can cancel them, I can feel better about myself. I can get them out of the way. This is what we call envy or covetousness. 
Covetousness is not just getting something that somebody else has, but actually living in the place of them. Like, I would want them out and me there. I want to take over their, their world, their lives. Elimination of others. Look at Saul. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre. And as he did every day, he would play. Saul had his spear in his hand, which is symbolic. It's the idea of authority. A king's spear said, I'm a free man. I'm a sovereign. A spear showed sovereignty. And he had it. So I'm gripping my self-made sovereignty. Think of the image here. And Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will, and the word pin is the word nail. I will nail David to the wall. Get it? Nail. David, to the wall. With my sovereign authority, I will kill his authority. Who's he fighting, actually, everybody? He's fighting God, because God's in David, isn't he? David's playing and singing the truths of God. The Holy Spirit's there. And Saul's starting to hate how God's writing the story. How, let me ask you this, guys. How do you think Saul should have reacted if that's who's sitting before him, David? toward What, what should be his, uh, his approach Toward David. Humility. It should be humility, yes. Yeah. Because he recognizes that God is above and sovereign in David, even above him. What else? How else do you think he should have comported himself? Grateful. Yeah, grateful. That's good. Fatherly. Fatherly. Preparing him for the role he's about to step into. Absolutely. I don't know about you, but I would go also with grateful in the sense that. I've got the secret weapon <laughs> here in my, sitting right in front of me. I mean, I have got the world's best warrior sitting here in front of me. I am so thankful. Why not work together <laughs> instead of seeing him as a hateful rival, which he was not? I'll pin David to the wall. But notice David evades him twice. So this time, Saul's uh, good marksmanship couldn't outdo it. Who, who's helping David be a ninja? It's the Holy Spirit. And he's running out of there. Uh, verse 12, Saul was afraid of David. So instead, because he missed, he wasn't just frustrated. Oh, I'll get him another time. Instead, what's being produced in the kingdom of, 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 of his disordered love for himself? His jealousy? Fear. He's degrading. He's not getting more courageous and more bold and, and more confident. He's degrading into jealous rage and fear. The Lord was with him, but he knew that the Lord had departed Saul. So I'm going to go after David because I can kill him. Well, then the Lord's got to come back on me. I'm the king. Maybe that was his reasoning. 13. There's the first mention of fear. So Saul removed him from his presence he said, if I, can't, if, if I can't kill you here and eliminate you in my presence, I'm going to get rid of you from my presence. I don't want to see you, your face anymore. And made him a commander of a thousand. Now, you just put David as commander of a thousand, and you know that David, and so the Philistines also know that David just killed your champion and a bunch of other guys while they were running away. What are you going to do? Well, you're going to amass 10,000 and 20,000 against his little group of a thousand, Right? And that's Saul's plan. I'll put him as an idea. Uh, so now Saul and his jealousy is like, I'm going to stick him out there. Let's get him in the heat of battle. That'll get rid of him. Because they'll be, he, David has a target on his back. He's lasered up. <laughs> David had success in all his undertakings for the Lord was with him. Who's fighting the battles now? It's God's battle, isn't it? Didn't David just say that in the last chapter? The battle is the Lord's. And so now, David, God is fighting battles in David and through David that David doesn't even recognize he has. Everywhere he goes, there is success, and the enemy is falling. Sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? And when Saul saw that he had great success, what took place? His fear increased. He's more and more afraid of this kid. Yeah, he became in fearful awe of him. He stood almost paralyzed in fear of David. He shouldn't have been afraid. He should have been grateful. He should have been 
thankful and, and praising God, but he didn't. But in the kingdom of love ordered by God, all of Israel loved and Judah loved David. For he went out and came before them. What does that mean? He took on um, sorties. <laughs> Every sortie he did, he went out, had success, and he came back in. And all the people saw him land and refuel. Can I put it that way? I'm really trying to get this language in here to identify. Oh, yeah. And now I see people writing that down because that's good. Right? So he would go out on a campaign and he would come back in and they would just be like, this guy is, is killing it, literally. <laughs> and David had this success. Now, there's something interesting in the verses. And the interesting word is that word spear. The word in Hebrew for the word spear is the word Cain. Kanin. Cain can mean two things. I have acquired or a spear or a javelin, a weapon. Eve used it of her son that I have acquired. But then Cain, the acquired son, possibly a Messiah figure, turned into the murderous brother, and he turned himself into the other meaning. He turned himself into the spear. And you'll remember on that day when Abel, which means vapor or breath, didn't even get to say a word in his lifetime, he served the kingdom of love. He obeyed God God loved him and approved him. He worked, he sacrificed properly, and the Lord approved of him. But he disregarded and disapproved of Cain's offering. And because of that lack of approval, Cain went and searched for love in all the wrong places. With what? The fruit of his hands. He was searching for the approval of God. God, you're here to bless me, not me to obey you. That's what Cain did. And when God didn't give it to him, but he gave that approval to his brother, he turned into a jealous rage, which grew. Here's the seeds. Suspect, then anger, then rage, then jealousy, then the spear. Cain was thrown at his brother, and Cain caned his brother to death. You see that? He speared him. He nailed him. And now we see that Saul, in a certain sense, wants to, if you will, cane David to the wall. Saul, acting like Cain, then takes up a cane and then throws a cane, trying to kill the new Abel in the kingdom of love. And that just pre-shadows that one day on the cross, our good news of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was called dead when a Roman soldier, a Gentile, took a cane in his hand, the spearhead, and went up and represented all of us, all our jealousy, all our rage, all our sin, and he pierced our Savior through as the last stab where we humans attacked. God and pinned him to the wall, nailed him to the cross. But our greater David laid his life down, allowed himself to be nailed through, caned through four different ways on that cross. And he went down into death. And what did he do? He took our cane down into death. And he responded with the justice of Abel. Remember God said, the bloods of Abel, the children of Abel, cry out to me from the ground for justice. And Jesus went down into the ground with our sin and brought justice. He conquered the evil one and he came up alive, exploding that stone off of the tomb. He came up alive. Instead, he had caned Cain. And that is our greater Abel and our greater David, who did not seek to evade, to evade, if you will, the cross and run from it. But he laid his life down and was broken on it. But he won. He was victorious. Why? Because that's the kingdom of love. The greatest gesture of love defeats the Cains coming after the Abel's. And gets the justice that Abel's blood cries out for. Do you see the gospel all dripping through the scriptures like this? Oh, I just love talking about these things with you. What does John say? For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning of the gospel. 
that we should love one another. Here's how you serve in the kingdom of love. We should not be like a spear, a cane, the end result, the tip of the spear of jealousy and rage. For he was evil. He was of, notice who he was driven by, the evil one himself. Just like Saul is driven too. <laughs> and murdered his brother. He wasn't just jealous of his brother. What did it lead to? Fear and then murder. And why did he murder him? John asks so he can give us an answer to interpret it. Because his own deeds were selfish. They were of the kingdom of disordered love. They were evil. His brother's deeds were righteous. Do you see that? You're either serving the kingdom of love or you're serving in the kingdom of fear, the kingdom of disordered love. Does that make sense so far, everybody? That's what John tells us. Don't be like Cain. The third and final one here is the cost of conspiracy. Let's look at this episode. It's, going, it's continuing to snowball. It is, we first saw love from the affirmation of others, love from the elimination of others, but Jesus came in and he eliminated. We tried to eliminate God and he elim instead he eliminated our sin that we might be loved and accepted. He, he wouldn't evade the elimination so that he could come back and we could be his people again. But then there's a, an idea that we can gain love and strength from the manipulation of others, controlling our circumstances and plotting and planning and working through secondary motivations. Verse 17, Then Saul said to David, Here is my elder daughter Merab, which means to increase or to grow. Uh, I will give her to you for a wife. Only you have to do something. You need to be valiant for me, and you have to fight the Lord's battles. Wait a second. Wasn't it in the last chapter that if the guy killed Goliath, you would award him with your daughter? I thought that's what everybody was saying. Saul reneges on that promise, doesn't he? He pulls it back, and he's like, oh, okay, I'm going to, so now he's going to trick. What is he going to say? You have to go out and fight the Lord's battles, kind of like what you did with Goliath. One of these days, you're going to fall. So he's trying to get him back out where his life is at risk. And so you can have the daughter, but there's a catch. There's a string attached. For Saul thought, let not my hand be against him. In other words, let the hand of the Philistines be against him. He'll fall there, and then everybody will know, uh, he didn't make it, and, and it wasn't me. It was somebody else that killed him, but I got rid of him anyway. So I'm going to manipulate the situation. David said to Saul, but here, here's his humility coming back. Who am I? And who are my relatives? You know, my father's clan in Israel were pretty much bakers and sheep care and, and shepherds, that I should be a son-in-law to the king. In other words, David's saying, I'm too poor to pay the bride price for you. You're the king. I, I, can't, I can't earn enough and give you enough to become a son-in-law. But at that time when Merib and, and Saul's like, well, that's okay. You just keep being a, a valiant warrior. And so he got him out there to fight. But then when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David. So I, I I'm guessing that there's like this betrothal time. He, she's pointed at David to marry him. And at the last minute, Saul calls it off and instead gives her to Adriel, the, the Meholathite. And I studied their names. It's very interesting. Adriel means a flock of God or a flock. And the Meholathite can mean weakness. So Merib, the one who increases, is given to the flock of God of Saul's choice to increase sickness and weakness and difficulty. See what's going on here? The plan will unfold. In 2 Samuel, we're going to see how that increases and unfolds. It's disastrous for Merib and Adriel. And so she goes to Adriel. So Saul cheats David in conspiracy. Now Saul's daughter, though, he had a second one, Michal. And Michal loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him because Saul's hatching another conspiracy. Saul thought, let me give her to him that she may be a snare for him and that the hand of the Philistine may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you can now be my son-in-law. Every time there's a story where there's two sisters fighting for one guy, trust me, there's drama in here. And Saul commanded his servants 
Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to send you out. You're going to talk to David in all these different ways. See what happened? The deep state is going in action, right? So he's going out. He's sending guys in private. And he's going to get David all beat up here. And he's going to say, behold, the king has delight in you. And all his servants love you. And now then become the king's son-in-law. Do it, David. Do it. So you're encouraging him. You can do it. And Saul's servant spoke these words in the ears of David. And David said, does it seem to you like a little thing to become the king's son-in-law? Since I am so poor and I have no reputation, I I wouldn't honor the king. I would dishonor him just because of my financial status, my economic status. And the servants of Saul told him, no, don't worry about it. You know, and then they went back to Saul and they said to Saul, well, he's talking like this. And so Saul cooks up the most bizarre bride price we could ever find in scripture. Thus, you should say to David, the king desires no bride price except 104 scripts of the Philistines and that he may be avenged of his king's enemies. This is bonkers. You know, (laughs) I'm just sitting there going, I was talking, how am I going to develop slides on this? (laughs) Now, Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. If he goes out against their greatest men of war, that's what he was asking, and a hundred of them at that, he'll never survive that. And he has to bring back this, as you can read. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. David was like, oh, that's it? Great, I can do that. (laughs) Just like... All right, I would go earn money, David. (laughs) But instead, he says, oh, that's going to be easy. Let's do it. (laughs) And so before the time had expired, what does David do? He arose, he went along with his men, and he doesn't just do 100. He kills 200 of the Philistines, and he brought the very things before Saul. And the way that it said is he counts them out before Saul, every one of us. So it's like, yeah, that's in the language. It's, it's pretty graphic. And Saul gave him his daughter Michal for a wife because he's like, okay, already, okay, already, okay. Already. So David gains a wife who loves him and Saul loses a daughter through stupidity and other things going on in his courtroom. And that's probably the end of me being discreet. But when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. This is increased because his plans are turning back on him. He, out of fear, he's becoming more and more desperate. So Saul was David's enemy continually. It wasn't David was Saul's enemy. It was Saul was David's enemy continually. And the commander of the Philistines came out to battle. As often as they came out, David had more success than all of the other commanders in Saul's army, so that his name was highly esteemed. Everybody kept talking about David's conquests. That's how the story ends in this part, this passage, this chapter. Do you see Saul's disordered loves, what's happening? God's unraveling all of his conspiracies. God's taking away all that he's holding dear because he's trying to love himself, and he has a Messiah complex. He has a I'm in it for me complex. And he ends up losing and putting his own family up on the altar and losing them in embarrassing ways as he cooks up these conspiracies. Guys, look carefully now. Let's reflect. We've heard a lot, kind of smiled a lot. We're like, oh yeah, wow, that gets pretty high court drama there. Think about disordered love. Disordered love starts with suspicion. It jades you with jealousy. It calculates with conspiracy. It pushes you then to panic and wages war. Wages war all the way to where you would rather see somebody dead until you yourself are gone and off this earth. And there are people that will frequent churches, join churches that will hold bitterness and selfish love and anger and jealousy and rage and panic for years until they die while going to church regularly. Look deep in our hearts, for we are the new populace, if you will, the new population of David. We're the new kingdom. If you are in the kingdom of love, we must renounce these selfish loves, looking for love in all the wrong places, these disordered loves that we have. 
We must be careful of them, and we must do what? Love our champion, our greater David, who guides us and leads us forward so that he's, by the way, our King David is still in conquest, isn't he? Because everywhere the church goes, isn't isn't that where the Lord dwells? Through his Holy Spirit, he dwells in our hearts. And if we are practicing in the, excuse me, if we are practicing in the kingdom of love, everything that God requires of us, what takes place? Love conquers evil. And the Lord is with us. And when we are practicing love, a dramatic love among one another, and I mean serving love, self-giving away, risky love, and then toward others, even in our community, our society, even toward people who are not like us. Friends, that kind of love is seeded in with our, with our prayers, our blood, our sweat, our tears, our desires for God. God always remembers those seeds, and he grows that kind of love. And wherever the church should go, there should be that the word that, that the fame of the church is growing. Look at what these people are doing. Look at the love. Look at how God's people love each other. Look at what these folks did here. Jesus said it this way, that the men of earth would see your good works and glorify your, your Father who is in heaven. When we live for the kingdom of love, may we put that on display. We put our king on display, on parade. And then may he be glorified. But if we look deep in our heart and you start seeing one of the phases happening here. I'm living in regular jealousy. I I find myself panicking. I'm often wanting to cancel somebody. I'm I'm looking for other ways to get around, to avoid, to to disown, to whatever. I'm always suspicious of that person. Guys, you're working for the wrong kingdom. You're more Saul than you are David. James says this. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? That you want to love for yourself? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. Well, that's the end consequence. This disordered love. You covet, you can't get it, you cannot obtain, you want to replace that person, so you fight and you quarrel to try to do it and control it. You don't have because you don't solve. The word Saul means to ask of God. You don't Saul correctly. Instead, you sound like the old Saul. You ask, you Saul, and you do not receive because you ask like the original Saul, wrongly, in the wrong Commitments and loves, right there, to spend it on your passions, looking for love in all the wrong places. John reassures us there is no fear in true love, but perfect love casts out the kingdom of fear, for fear has to do with punishment. What will others do to me? And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. How are you perfected in love? When the gospel goes deep. You are perfected in love because he first loved you. There's your fuel. You are responding to the love and kind that God has given to you. So here's the good news. In Jesus, you have been given a mission of joy, not of fear, not of anger, not of hatred. You've been given a mission of joy to live for the kingdom of love so that wherever his bride goes, the reign of fear crumbles at the fame of his name. And that's what we do together. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. We are the new, if you will, band of David. We're in the new kingdom. May you serve the kingdom of love.